So we pray today that the Lord will just give us understanding and that he will minister what he wants to minister to all of us today. And the first person who gets preached to is the preacher. And so I, I thank the Lord for the opportunity to minister today, to serve you today in the word of God. We're going to talk about being close to Jesus today. Now this message is not... Um, about judgment. It's not about me wanting to know where you are with God, but it's more of a message to challenge you to examine your own heart, examine your own life, to see where you are with the Lord. The Lord wants us to be close to him. He wants us to be close to him that we are He's not just this God that is far off, that he's Jesus who died on the cross, but he actually is someone that we know and have a relation with. My oldest son, Brandon, when he was real little, he loved going to his Paul Paul Reese's house, my dad, who's in heaven now. And they were overheard arguing at, at their kindergarten one day. These little boys were bragging about stuff and him and his two little buddies and they were talking about, of course, Brandon always thought he was the toughest kid on the block. And he was pretty tough. But he said, one little boy, teacher is telling me this later, said one little boy said, I am so tough that I can wear out a pair of shoes in a week. Another little boy said, I'll tell you what, I am so tough I can wear out a pair of jeans in a day. And they said, Brandon said, that's nothing. When my parents take me to see my grandma and grandpa, I can wear them out in an hour. <laughs> and he could. <laughs> so the Lord wants us to be like that, though. He wants us to be close to him. And you're not going to wear out your welcome with him. But some, so many times we think we have to be super spiritual or have the right prayer or know how to pray a certain way. And all those things are great and they're good. And, you know, church is great, and prayer services are great, and classes are great, but you need a personal time with the Lord that he becomes your friend. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Jesus, and this is the New American Standard Bible, Jesus starts telling a story, a parable. He's comparing it to uh, brides who are fixing to go with the groom. And he, he compares it to that, and he compares it to ten virgins. He said, The kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish. Five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take extra oil with them. But the prudent ones took oil and flask with their lamps. Now, while the groom was delaying, they all become drowsy and they begin to sleep. See, it was a, it was a Jewish culture. We'll just stop a minute and we'll get back to that. But it's, it's a Jewish culture that the groom would allow the those that are waiting, the bridesmaids or the brides, and he would have his man, whoever that was, to let them know it is time for the wedding. And he would actually go within a shouting distance of the bride's home. And he would personally escort the brides to the wedding venue. And then when all the guests and the bride, and of course in Jewish culture, that could be more than one bride, we know that. He would shut the door and lock that door. No one else was allowed to come in because they did not want any invited guest or anyone to take advantage of what was going on in that wedding feast, which is representative of the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation that we will be invited to. So it was a Jewish custom for this to happen. So this is what's going on. So they, they, some of them took their extra oil. Some of them didn't. didn't and they're, they're sort of waiting uh, outside the doors of their dad's house, their mom's house. 
And they're waiting for the bride or the groom rather to say, hey, it's time to come. But when the, the voice was made, hey, it's time. But at midnight, verse 6 says, there was finally a shout. Behold the groom. Come out to meet him. And all these virgins got up and they trimmed their lamps. But the foolish virgins said to the prudent ones or the wise ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. However, verse 9 says, the prudent ones answered, no, there must certainly would not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. Verse 10. But while they were departing on their way to buy the oil, I want you to catch that, while they were departing on their way to buy the oil, the groom come, and those that are ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Yet later, the other virgins also came to that door, and they began to knock on that door, and they said, Lord, Lord, open up for us. Verse 12 is a key verse you need to get. I want you to look at it. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. I've never had a relationship with you. I really don't know who you are. Be on alert then because you do not know the day nor the hour. And we know that's referring to the Lord's return. But to us today, it could refer to when the Lord returns for you and me. Whether we meet him out there in a terrible accident or... You, you die at 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. It doesn't matter. It's about the Lord's return for us. Be alert. Let your heart re be ready. I do not know you. I never had a relationship with you. Let's go to number one. What's inside your lamp? What's inside your lamp? That's the first question we have to ask. Not, do you have the extra oil yet, but what's inside your lamp? Because it took a specific oil to light the lamp. You couldn't just get any oil. You couldn't just pour something in there you wanted to pour. It wasn't going to burn. You couldn't go down to the store and buy gasoline. It was a specific oil that they used. It was processed. It was hard to get it. And that day, you couldn't go to the uh, store and get it. You had to go to a merchant that actually produced it through going through different processes with animals. But my question to us today is what is inside of our lamp? Have you been born again? Or do you just have a religious experience? Now, I would be, probably be safe to say most of you have. Maybe some online haven't that will listen to this later. But I ask the question because Jesus, or because the groom here representing Jesus said, I, I don't know you. You're knocking. You ran and got the oil. But I don't know you. So what's inside your lamp today? What kind of oil do you have in you? Is it the oil of Self-righteousness, all of works, is all of religion. I know about God. I've always went to church. Or do you know Jesus truly as your Savior and your Lord and your King? Have you been born again? It says in John 3 and 3, Jesus answered him, and said, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, that's Greek from born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When this priest comes to him and asks him, how can I be in the kingdom? He said, you got to be born again. Well, how can I be born again? I've already been born one time. He said, you don't understand what is spirit is spirit, what is flesh is flesh. This is a spiritual birth. It says in verse 5 and 6, look at it. Unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. When you were born, you were born of, of water. 
your mama's water broke. You were born of flesh. But that is born of spirit is spirit. That is something that's born from above. When you come and you repent of your sins, you can't see it. Jesus said it's like the wind that blows. How many knows you can feel the wind? And you can see the effects of the wind. But you can't see it. So the wind of the Holy Spirit is the same way when we get born again. When we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins and we repent and we come to him, you'll feel the presence of God come into your life. The Holy Spirit will come into your life. Now, you haven't been baptized in the Spirit yet, but you receive the Spirit because you can't even receive the Spirit unless the Spirit draws you. And so he draws you, you come, you've been born again, and then you begin to sit, feel the effects of it, don't you? You can't do a lot of things you used to do. I don't know if you got the same kind I got, but that's, I'm just telling you that after I was born again, I began to develop a relationship with Jesus. The things I used to do, I couldn't do anymore. You know why? I had conviction on my life. I had the fear of God that came on my life. I didn't want to do those things anymore. It wasn't because I, I wasn't going to do them so I could get to heaven. It was because I had heaven living in me. His name is Jesus. Amen? I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to around and drink with my buddies anymore. I didn't want to go out and do the things they were doing anymore. Because my heart changed. And that's what I'm asking you. Have you had a heart change? Have you been born again from above? Have you had a, a spiritual encounter? Did you, have you experienced God in a real, genuine way? Because apparently the five foolish virgins... The reason they didn't have the wisdom to know what extra oil, the baptism of, of the Holy Spirit, or more oil even was, is because they just had some kind of religious experience. They knew about him. They knew they'd been invited to be part of his, his uh, company and become his bride, but they really didn't know him. Because don't you know that he had had sessions with them and said, make sure you bring extra oil. Be ready. Because unless you have extra oil, let's go to number two here. How much oil do you have in your lamp today? Do you have enough oil in your lamp? Are you walking close enough to God today? Do you have that extra oil, the Holy Spirit in your life, the anointing in your life that will keep you until he returns or keep you through what you're going through? Not just to catch you in a way, but until he returns for you. Until you go into the world. Listen, we're going to go through stuff. It's not going to be good stuff. Life can drain us. Heartache can break us. But God can keep us. But we must be walking in his presence because if we don't, it's, it's, it's the faith that is built in us because of that relationship with God, the Word of God that we love. It builds faith in us. And you'll, we, you will love the Word of God on a personal, not, not my preaching, but your Bible. You will open that, and you'll fall in love with that when you have enough oil in your life. If you find yourself not having a desire to pray anymore, because that's communication with the Lord, right? Not having desire to read the Word of God anymore. Not having desire to witness anymore. Your oil is low. And you need to check yourself. Because here's what happens when our oil gets low. We begin to struggle. Fear sets in. Anxiety sets in. Weakness of the flesh begins to dominate us instead of the, the strength of the Holy Spirit. How many knows we need him? Without him, we can't do anything. But through Christ, we can do what? All things. Help me preach today. So we need the Holy Spirit. We need the extra oil. We need to receive the Holy Spirit into our lives and walk in that every day. In this parable, it was while he took his time that people ran out of the oil. While life was going on, 
while we're waiting on the return of Christ, while we're going through life with things. Now, I wonder who was a merchant. He said they departed and went away to a merchant. Who was the merchant? Where were they looking for their oil? Apparently, it wasn't the kind that the groom had said get because when they come to the door, let us in. Please let us in. I don't know you. I'm sorry, but I truly, truly don't know you. Was it that they was going to the world for their oil? Going to some kind of religious experience for their oil? Their own works for their oil? Trying to use other things? Do we do that? We, do we try to use other things to fill us? To fill that emptiness, that longingness? And we try it. We try it with work. We try it with relationships. We try it with a lot of money. We try it with food. We try it with everything, but it, it fails us. What were they doing? I don't know. All I know is when they returned, the door was shut and locked because they never had a real experience with God. And I'm just encouraging you today. I'm not doubting your experience. I am encouraging you to have a real experience and keep it real every day. How many here, don't raise your hand, but I'm just asking this question, okay? But how many here that you just go without food for two or three days? You don't eat anything. You don't drink any water. Probably most of you, unless you're very sick, you would say, no, I can't do that. I eat something every day. I drink water every day because you hunger and thirst for it because your body needs it to keep you alive. And spiritually, the only way you're going to stay alive is if you eat of the bread of life, Jesus, every day. You eat the Word of God every day. You spend time with Him in His presence every day. Otherwise, your spiritual man or woman will begin to shrivel up. Number three. I have a whole message on this one, but I won't preach it today. Are you a fan? Are you just a fan or a follower? There's a lot of fans of Jesus. I have met people that on worship teams, in ministry circles, that teach the Bible. That will have told me, and I won't tell you who they are, but there are people I'm talking about in the Denton area. And they say, I've never really experienced God. But he's, a, he's the best that I can find. And so I believe he's a true prophet. I believe he's, you know, probably was the Messiah. But, you know, most of the Bible, I just believe, is just really stories. It's not, a lot of it's not true. But it's just the best thing going. So this is what I'm going to teach. People on the worship team, never had experience with God. They jump around every Sunday. Not here. Thank God. Amen. But that I have met in my travels... And they say, I've never known the Lord. I preach a message like this. And they come to the altar and say, I've never known the Lord. I've never experienced him. I said, what are you doing on the worship team? Because it's fun. Jesus is a cool guy. So you may be out there today or watch this later. And you may be a fan of Jesus. And you may think, yeah, he's great. He fed the multitudes. He healed the sick. He had compassion. He loved people. And that's the reason why I follow him, because I'm a fan. But a follower is someone who's seeing who he is as a Messiah, as a Lord and the King. And you follow him because you want to be discipled by him. You want to hear what he has to say. You want to be like John and sit close to him and hear his heartbeat. Because when you hear the heartbeat of Jesus, you hear the heartbeat of God. If they hadn't have been close to Jesus, they would have never have known. When he told them in Acts chapter 1 to go and wait on the promise, they would have never have known how to do different things that they'd done if they hadn't have sat at the feet of Jesus and been his disciples. They weren't just fans. They were like followers. They were devoted, committed followers and become disciples and eventually become apostles. 
So ask yourself a question. Examine. Let's examine our hearts today. I'm, I'm being serious. We, I love you so much, but I'm, be, I'm, I'm seeing too much of this in the land today. Examine our hearts and see where you really are. Take inventory of your life. If you're satisfied with what you have and where you are, you're lukewarm. I know it's a hard word, but it's true. If you don't desire more of God, if you don't desire to get closer to God, you're lukewarm. That's exactly where the church Laodicea was in Revelation. How much oil do you have in your life? How close? What is your spiritual walk with your father today? It's just not enough for us to go to church. Oh, I, I'm so proud of you being here today, but it's just not enough. We need a real relationship with a real God. Can you hear the Holy Spirit crying out to some of you today? And he said, I want to be closer. But because of life, you become hard and you become callous and, and you, you're losing your faith and your way. And you're saying, Lord, why? Is it even worth it? I deal with people every day on the phone, spend a lot of hours online ministering to people. And I've never seen so many people that are falling away. The apostasy, it means to fall away from the line, to fall away from the state of mind. That spirit of apostasy is here. What's your personal relationship like today? I don't need to know. But you do. Number four. Are you being consistently filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you get in your prayer closet and pray in the Spirit every day? Some of you are going to pray in tongues. Some of you may pray in a stammering lip. But have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? We'll talk about that one just here in a minute. But are you being consistently filled with the Spirit? My dad used to say this, and I, I love this saying, it's funny, but he said, you know, we're human and we leak. Life drains us, troubles test us. We don't lose our salvation, but you can backslide really quick. <laughs> and growing lukewarm is dangerous. But Jesus said in Acts 1, and five, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus said this to his disciples. He was saying, to know me is great. That'll get you to heaven and you need that. But you need more than that to get you through what you're fixing to face. Some of you are going to win nations and disciple nations. Some of you are going to be martyred. You're going to go through things that you never thought you'd go through. And you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The next one, Ephesians 5.18. is amplified. Do not get drunk with wine, for this is wickedness. It's corruption. It's stupid as believers. Trying to fill a void of needing to be getting rid of anxiety. But be filled with the Holy Spirit, consistently guided by Him. The Bible says that wine is a mocker. It will mock you. Me and my oldest son had this discussion just a few couple weeks ago because he struggled with this all his life thinking that he could be a believer and still drink and not have a problem with getting drunk. But you see, wine is a mocker. It's an open door. I'm not saying if you're drinking and you drink wine with your meal that you're in sin. I'm not telling you that because the Bible doesn't say that. But I will tell you this. It's an open door for the enemy to use against your life. If you're facing anything and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit to give you power to overcome, the enemy is going to offer you wine, drugs, any kind of alcohol to fill that void. 
Well, it's quiet in Texas when you preach that, I know. That's all right. Jude 1 and 20 says this, But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in how? The Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Ghost. He said, you build up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He didn't say by going to church, that's good, you need to go to church. I'm not downing that. I'm just saying that's not how you build your holy faith. I love podcasts. I love great preaching, great worship. That helps me. I, I, I was taught sort of like the IHOP uh, upper room style, trained up in that way to pray where you, you worship in warfare and you pray and you go after God and you break through. And now all that is wonderful, but it does not build my faith unless I get in the word and begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. And when I begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, can you, you know why? Because that's not, that's not of you. It's from heaven. It's the promise that the Father sent to fill us up. You don't have to be drunk with wine anymore, he was telling the Jewish culture. That's how you kept yourself going, but now I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and you can be full of the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit, building your faith. If you're not praying the Holy Spirit is a Pentecostal church, I am in a Pentecostal church, right? You're independent. I know that. I am too. But we, we do believe in, in the Holy Spirit, don't we? Baptism, Holy Spirit. Okay. One, one, two. But we need to spend our, our personal time in God's presence. See, nobody should know. Ah, I've been an hour in prayer today. Bless God. I prayed in tongues for an hour and a half. And then I went out and won 10 souls. Well, that's your reward. You just told everybody. It's about your personal time with God. Whether you speak in tongues or not, or you've, you've, you've got that hunger in that part of your life yet or not, but you spend that time with God. And when you witness, that's between you and God and that pers person. I'm not going to tell you how many people I've won to the Lord. I, I, there was a preacher who used to do that, and it got on my nerves so bad. He'd tell how much money he give to the missions and how many people they won to Jesus. And the Bible is very clear about that. When you do that, that's your reward. I'd rather my reward be in heaven. Do all that, but don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Amen? I want God to reward me and say, well done, son. I don't care if you ever pat me on the back. I don't care if you like me or not. I love you, but I don't care if you like me or not. I want to be accepted by the king. That's just too rough. That's all right. That's who I am. Because if we don't pray in the spirit and build up our faith, if we don't Take the time, it says, pray in the Spirit. Look at Jude 120 again. Building yourselves up in the most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. I know I'm looking at that back one back there. It says the same thing. If you don't do that, then the opposite happens. You're not building yourself up. If you were doing works of the flesh... And I'm not even going to get into what that may be for you because it's different for everyone else. You're tearing yourself down. If I go home and talk about you and tell everybody how bad you treated me or because of your personality or what you got or how spiritual or unspiritual you are, I'm tearing myself down. Because you're the body of Christ. And when I attack you, I attack Jesus. That's the reason I've always been so careful, even with preachers on TV I don't agree with. I am not going to criticize them. I'm going to say I don't agree with that. But I am not going to go around and talk about them because no matter if they're in error in some parts of their life, if they preach Jesus as Lord and you have to go through the cross to get saved, they're my brother, my sister. And I'm not going to attack them because they're body of Christ. It brings judgment on us when we do that. Quiet again. Number five. I'll hurry up. I know some of you are hungry already. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized? 
you know what baptism in water is, right? It's fully submersed. Now, when you were saved, you received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit drew you. So you could take a, I could take a glass and get a water pitcher. I could pour that in, in, that, pit, in that glass or in this bottle. And yes, you have the Spirit because you can't get to heaven without the Holy Spirit. But being baptized in the Spirit is going a little further and doing what Jesus told the disciples to do in Acts for the empowerment to witness and make disciples and to live your life better and to be able to do, allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate out of you, which I still believe are for today. I, I still believe in the fivefold ministry. If I if I'm told not to preach anymore, I won't. But I still believe in the fivefold ministry. I still believe there's apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. I still believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and still believe it's needed today. But being baptized in the Holy Spirit just means I take this bottle of water and I get in the bathtub and I put it under. Now it's not just in me, it's all over me. It's around me. It's controlling me. It's leading me. It's guiding me. It's comforting me. I'm protected by it. I have peace in it. It's just an extra that heaven has provided for us. And it's sad when people fight about this. And I'm not going to fight anyone about it. But the Lord has more for you, but you have to want more. What do he say? Draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. Come close to me, I'll get close to you. You have to desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's look real quick at Acts chapter 2. Because here's what I want you to understand. Even though I may not yell and scream and jump and roll like a lot of my forefathers did, that's okay. That was great. That's okay if the Holy Spirit gets on you and you do it. I don't care. I don't care how stupid you look. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't care how quiet you are. It doesn't bother me either. But the Holy Spirit did not come quiet. Oh, let's just come in here and let's just not make any noise. We don't want to upset anybody. Now, he does move gentle as a dove. He will not force himself on you. He will not make you go further than you want to go. If you're uncomfortable with it, he will back up. Did you know that? Because he loves you. But if you desire more, he'll keep pouring it out. But I want you to look how the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus told them, don't you leave Jerusalem. It was a command. It wasn't a suggestion. Don't you leave until you're filled with the Holy Spirit until the promise has come that was prophesied. And so in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, you still with me? And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. We have some of those in Texas, don't we? It's about 60, 70 mile an hour wind. You can hear it over there. It come blowing in that place. It came from heaven. God wanted them to know this wasn't man-made. He wanted them to know this was something he was doing. Now, does it still come that way? Most often not. But it moved, he moves in different ways. It will still have an effect around us. But I want you to look at how he sent it the first time because he wanted to get our attention that it's different than what not just not having any experience like this is. So it came like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the parts of the house. Oh, it didn't say that, did it? How much did it fill? The entire house. The entire house. God doesn't want to fill part of your house. He wants to fill the entirety of you. He doesn't want to just live in part of your physical house. He wants to have control of your whole house. Now, this is a word from the Lord. I don't know why I'm saying this, but you need to get in your house and anything that's hindering the Holy Spirit from moving your home, you need to get it out of your home. 
You need to cut some stuff off. Whatever is hindering you, get it out of your house. Spiritually and physically. So the Lord is welcome. Let him be welcome there. Let the atmosphere of the Lord be welcome in your house. Not just this house, but in your house. And we know we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But he wants to live with you. Man, I love it when I can. And I don't know if you've experienced this or not. I'm sure you have. But I love it. Like when Brother Don invited me to his house when we first came. And I came to his house. When I walked in, you know what I always look for? The peace of God. Not, I don't look with these eyes, but with my heart. And you know, when I walked in this door, what I felt? Peace of God. When I went out to visit Dave and Sherry, you know what I felt out there in their property? Even though they was working hard in their garage, I felt the peace of God. See, we need the peace of God to rule our homes and our land and our house. So that when others come in that atmosphere, they know God's here. And sinners will come and they start... They start feeling uncomfortable. Are they under conviction? Or begin to weep? Because the presence of the Lord is there. It's not about just keeping it inside these walls here. I ain't going to charge you anything extra for that, okay? That's just something the Holy Spirit wanted me to say. So fill the entire house where they're sitting and divided tongues of fire. Everybody say fire. 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 Affects different people in different ways. Some people say, oh my God, it's fire. Some people, ah, it's fire. When the Holy Spirit and fire comes into your life, it will affect you. It will change you. It's like I was telling you before, I can't do the things I used to do because that fire burns in me. I can't preach like I used to preach because the fire burns in me. I can't help it. My wife, you know, I used, when I was pastoring, she'd say, well, I don't know if you should have said that as much. I said, I can't help it. I can control my mouth, but I can't control what's in here. And she'd say, oh, yeah, that's right. Let the fire burn. Because the fire not only consumes you, God is a consuming fire that will consume you. He burns up all the dross in your life, all the junk in your life that you can't do yourself. He burns it up, but not only that, it gets on others. Changes us. Rushing wind. A fire rested on them. It rested. It didn't just, oop, I'm gone. It rested on them. And they were filled. Everybody say filled. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. You know what? You say, well, yeah, you know, but that was for them. Do you understand this never happened before? Do you understand that they were going to be labeled weird? They were going to be labeled as drunks? See, this wasn't Pentecost. This is what fell on Pentecost. This was the promise of the Father that was sent to those who went and waited for it because they wanted to be closer to God. They wanted more of God. And Jesus said, go and don't leave and be filled and be empowered. And they said, yes, sir. They didn't just, a lot of them didn't show up. Do you know that? Only 120. And some of them were like his brothers and his mother and some other friends. But not all the disciples showed up because there's over 5,000 disciples. So only 120 wanted more of God. The rest of them ended up Baptist. I'm not just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> That was a bad joke, all right? It was a bad joke. My, half of my family is Baptist, so. And they're filled, they're filled with the Spirit, too. Amen? But they didn't get what all God wanted for them. How many times do we walk away, even from a church service, and we don't press in, well, God ain't going to do nothing here today. Well, he's not for you because you just said it. But what if... Instead of worrying about what they're singing, what the temple of the song is, what the preacher's preaching, who's there and who's not there, what if instead of that we got our eyes on Jesus and began to go after the heart of God and say, I just want you, Lord. I want you to move in this house. I want you to change hearts and lives. 
I want people to leave different than they came. And you begin to bless this house. You begin to bless the people around you. I promise you it makes a difference. But as long as you sit back there and complain about everything, don't like anything, guess what? You're going to live it. Because it, it ain't going to just be here. It's going to follow you home. I had a preacher that I knew that was, a, he was a good friend of mine, but we always talked honest to each other and he would go into churches and things always go wrong. Things are always happening. So he'd go about six months to another church and six months to another church and was talking one day. He's older than I was. And he said, uh, about 10 years, my senior. He said, Curse, I just don't understand everywhere I go. It's like that. And I said, you know why, don't you, brother? He said, why? I said, because you're taking it with you. You're carrying all that hurt. You're carrying all that bitterness. You're carrying all that angry, anger. I said, you ask me, I'm, I love you, but I'm telling you the truth. You preach angry. You don't preach anointed. You think you're preaching anointed. You can preach anointed loud or quiet. Some of us are just louder than others. Somebody knows that. I get excited. I'm going to tell you this story. I'm going to close, okay? My wife is very quiet. She loves the Lord. She worships deep. She has uh, a prayer life and, and devotion time like nobody I've ever seen. She, but she's quiet about it. Nobody would ever know it. I know it because I live with her. But she's always been so quiet. And she'll worship and tears will flow. But she never says anything loud. My oldest son, when he started playing basketball, we went to his basketball game. And all of a sudden, my quiet wife turned into this wild woman and began to scream and holler, Go, Brandon, go! And I was like, who is this woman? She scared me. It was because she had passion for her son. She wanted him to succeed. Now, I'm not saying she... She has to do that church because I know because I, I know her passion is deep. But I'm saying sometimes we withhold that passion because we're afraid of what people think, or we form the theology. Some people form the theology have to be loud to be heard, or be for the spirit to move. Some have formed the theology have to be quiet. Neither one of those is right. God wants you to be you. He just wants you to be you in His presence. Amen. So the last thing is, how close do you want to be to Jesus? How close do you want to be to Jesus? Draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. I'm going to play, have them play a song, just keep that slide up there, Bill or whoever's up there, I can't see. Just keep that slide up. I want to play a song, I Need You More. And you can sit there and you can talk to the Lord. You can come and kneel, talk to the Lord. If you need prayer after this song, we're going to pray for you. But let's just spend some quiet moments with the Lord right now. <laughs>